we're going to bring up your, your next speaker. That's going to be the wonderful, magnificent Chris James. If you talk about how much you hate your fat, your body has been working all this time to keep you alive. I don't think anybody in my circle understands impossible. Howdy. What's up, YouTube? What's going on, family? Uh, I think it's been about a week or so since I've been live. But I'm back. I'm back, baby. How y'all feeling? Let me know. You can hear me. You can see me. Shout out where you from, where you tuning in from. We're going to get this ball on the road. Got to get the ball on the road where the rubber meets the road. I think the last live stream I did, we talked about the difference between can and will. If you guys have not seen that live stream, you want to go check that out because I absolutely, I I crushed it, okay? If I do say so myself, I decided not to come so hard today. We're not, it's not AHA after dark today. It's still daylight, kind of. What's up, Jennifer? Let me know y'all can hear me. Y'all can see me. You can hear me. I got King Kong in my trunk. Okay, I'm glad you guys like the introduction. My editor will be very pleased. <clears throat> Shout out to Clever Tricks. Today we're going to be chatting about the impact that fasting has on the immune system and how you can use that to combat cold and flu since we are in the cold and flu season. I think we're well in the cold and flu season at this point. And I touched on this a little bit in the last live stream, I think. But I figure we could do a, a kind of a whole talk. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all, I'm detoxing. I figure we could do a whole talk about this, this subject because I want people to understand it. I don't know if y'all can't hear me. Can y'all hear me? Can somebody tell me if you can hear me or not? Can somebody say, put a one in the chat if you can hear me? Something. Just give me a sign that y'all can hear me. Can you guys hear me? I'm trying to use my hands in case you can't. And that way, you know, click in the chat if you can hear me. All right. Thank you. Sheesh. Okay. So... Cold and flu season. All right. I'm going to tell y'all, too. I'm going to do a little bit of, of interacting tonight. I'm not going to be here too long, but I'm going to do some interacting tonight if you guys are interested. So you could be prepared for that. You guys can start putting questions in the chat if you want to. Obviously, any questions relating to the topic, great. Any questions you guys have just relating to fasting, you know, feel free to put those in the chat as well. So we talked a little bit last time about the, the cold and flu season. And one of the things I was pointing out is that viruses, colds, or germs, it's not like they work out or exercise or prepare for the cold and flu season. And then all of a sudden now it's, it's their season like it's a basketball game and they're ready to play. Okay. And the reason I like to use that analogy is because I want you all to understand that we are being told that there is there is something that happens every season, just like the the changing of the leaves or the winter, the winter snow. Every so many months, there's something called the cold and flu season that's just simply going to happen. And it's a natural part of this world. So I want to dispel that. There is no such thing as the cold and flu season. It is a human construct. And the way that we construct the cold and flu season is through propaganda as well as habits. 
there's no reason why you all should be getting or dealing with more illness during this winter, quote unquote, cold and flu season or this winter season um, versus any other time of the year. The reason why we see this extreme between, you know, maybe like this time and summertime is just simply our habits. So holiday time, we're getting with family, we're eating a lot, we're eating more than we typically would. Um, our dishes are more extravagant than they typically would be. You know, we're spending extra money to 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 impress people. And we're also doing a lot of candy and treats and cookies and just things that we typically would not do. So I want you all to understand this because if you can if you can grasp the concept that there's no such thing as a cold and flu season and it's it's a manipulation of our habits during this time of year, you could take control over this quote unquote cold and flu season and really never have to deal with it again. Now I've told you guys many times I don't get sick. The last time I really got sick was years and years and years ago and it's been like that for a long time. Even before I started my health and wellness journey, what we would consider a sickness, I didn't really get too much. I'd, I'd get it twice a year. And it would usually happen winter sol solstice and summer solstice. That was my thing. So since I changed my diet, started fasting, et cetera, et cetera, I don't get sick at all anymore, which is a blessing. Okay. But the reality is you guys can, there's certain things you could do to boost your immune system during this time so that let's just say you're not there yet. You know, you're not where I'm at. You're you're still struggling with your diet. You're still going to go and have that uh, four cheese macaroni or that, you know, those candied yams. Y'all know what I'm talking about, them candied yams, where it's basically candy and yams and in, in, mixed in there a little bit. Yeah, I know. My, my grandma used to make them and they were just incredible. So we can utilize fasting as a tool to help boost our immune system, knowing that we're going to be indulging in things that aren't necessarily the best for us. <clears throat> I've talked about this before, how I have friends and family who are aware of fasting and they use fasting as a crutch. I don't recommend this, but what I will say is as you all are tra transitioning away from old habits, this is a great tool that you can use to your advantage. And it's essentially creating a short window fasting schedule that you perform, you know, once a week. And this would just help keep you level during this time when we're consuming a lot of processed foods and refined sugars, as well as dairy. <clears throat> I got all this mucus all of a sudden. So. One interesting thing about fasting is when you fast, now we're going to be talking about a, a three-day fast because when you do a three-day fast, you're going to reap the benefits. You're going to reap kind of the maximum benefits with the, the, the least amount of time. If you, start, if you start doing shorter fasts, you don't get as much benefit. So for example, in order to fully exhaust your uh, glycogen reserves, you need twelve to sixteen hours. If you're not if you're not fasting for that long, you're not fully flushing those reserves. You know, so when we talk about like those short intermittent fasting schedules, um, they're they're not going to be as efficient as it would be if you were to do you know a longer fast. But there are some benefits you can get from a daily intermittent fast. And what we notice is that the immune cells, the immunity cells become more invigorated. OK, so just like we can get sluggish and slow and lazy and, and just feel dull, our cells can get that way as well. I don't think that we truly understand the cells um, uh, well enough because we haven't been taught enough about them, especially in our basic uh, you know, science or biology classes. The cells are not just these single-celled organisms that don't know what they're doing and they're just going off instinct or whatever to, whatever it is. They pretty much are just like we are. They have thoughts. They have ambitions. <clears throat> they have duties. They mate. 
<laughs> so they reproduce. They inside of a cell, they have organelles, so they have their own um, digestive systems and things of that nature. They are alive. They are just like we do. And sometimes they get sluggish. Now, what causes them to get sluggish? Oh, well, it's what they're consuming. What controls what they consume? We do. We control what the cells consume. The cells can only use what we give them as a resource. It's no different from if you put a seed in the ground and you put an orange seed in the ground, you're only going to get an orange. You're never going to get an apple or a pear from an orange seed. You reap what you sow. So the cells can only reap what we are sowing. And this is where things start to get a little dicey. If we are sowing, Christmas cookies, brownies, fudge cakes, macaroni and cheese, turkey with the gravy and the can. You guys know that can um, cranberry sauce. It's got to be the canned cranberry sauce. If that's all you're feeding yourselves, then they're going to get sluggish just the same way you get sluggish. Right. You, you eat your nice big Thanksgiving turkey dinner, whatever the case may be. You get sluggish. We call it the itis. Other people may call it other things. The reality is, is that that food has an enormous energy drain on us. <clears throat> and it's not just us, our, our holistic being that feels it. The cells feel it. Everything feels it. So by being intentional about performing some fasting during this time, um, especially if you if you elongate your fast and go from like your inner your intermittent fast to like a, a three day fast or something like that, you can help boost and enhance the cells. So not only are you going to get more vigor from your cells, like I said, you can get more vigor from the shorter fasts, um, but you can also get the cells to create more <laughs> immune cells. Okay, so the cells that are going to help to boost and protect, you can create more of them by, by utilizing fasting. So me personally, I would say that this is something that we really must do during this time of year when we're putting this additional stress on our bodies. Like, I, I think that it is more important to, to fast and in between, in between all of our poor habits <clears throat> it's more important to, to, to do all these good things because of the enormous stress we're going to be putting ourselves. There's another curious thing that the body does that some of you might be familiar with when you fast, especially when you do your longer fast. Okay. You guys might be familiar with these cells that um, can pretty much become any cell. It's a, it's a cell that can pretty much become any cell. It can do any job that you need it to do, okay? They're called stem cells. Now, traditionally, it's believed that you really can only get stem cells from something else. You know, they'll, they'll extract them from a baby fetus. They'll extract them from other animals, or they'll try to synthesize these stem cells in different ways using a laboratory. Did you all know that fasting boosts the production of stem cells? So all this time we've been looking for stem cells and all this research and all this, oh, we got to get it from this. We got to get it from that. We got to synthesize them and blah, blah, blah. And we can put them in a capsule and we can inject them. All this time we've been doing all this research and all you have to do is fast. If this doesn't show you that your body is perfectly designed, and, and it's, it's, it is an enclosed system that works. It just simply works. If this doesn't show you that, I don't know what else will. So stem cells can pretty much heal, repair, and become anything you need it to become. It's a blank slate. And they're extremely powerful. When you fast, you be, your body naturally produces more stem cells. You're going to get them in what we would consider excess. So a lot of the work that needs to be done, the stem cells can begin becoming the repair mechanism or the, the repair material for that work. If you couple that with a dietary strategy that supports good nutrition, 
now you have a you have a a, um, a one-two punch i will say it's a one it's a perfect one-two punch then you continue this cycle right so when you when you start your 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 holiday holiday festivities one thing i want you all to keep in mind is that you don't have to be gluttonous i understand that thanksgiving promotes gluttony right and and it's it promotes it in a way that we don't even realize that it is gluttony but it is gluttony most of us are going to eat more than what we can we celebrate it it's almost a badge of honor during this time and I want to bring this to your awareness because it doesn't have to be that way. You guys can still enjoy your family. You can still enjoy, you know, all the festivities of foods and things. But if you reduce the quantity or the amount of food you consume or even the frequency, you can get through this cold and flu season without having to deal with the detrimental effects of the food and everything else we're doing. It's very common. When I was younger, we would, um, my friends would have several different houses they'd go to for Thanksgiving. I never really did that personally, but I knew a lot of people did it. And even as I got older, it became a thing where, you know, people, they'll start off at one house. You know, usually it's it's whoever those people are that start early. There's certain families, they start eating early. You know what I'm saying? They'll be eating by noon. That was not our family. We didn't start eating until after 5 p.m. And uh, people thought we were crazy for eating so late. And I thought people for, were crazy for eating so early. But it worked out great because then you could go to someone's house early. Then you had the midday meal and then you had the late evening meal. And then, of course, you collect a take home plate for each one of them. You know. It is OK to celebrate the holiday and enjoy your family, but we have to practice um self-discipline and control during this time and if we can make the correlation between the the our level of health how we're going to feel and how we're going to function and perform especially leading into the new year if we can make that connection to the foods we eat leading up to that point i think we'll make better decisions now i know a lot of you all are out there it's time for you know start thinking about your new year's resolution like what are you going to do in a new year what do you want to accomplish and I tell you guys all the time, it's important to start your New Year's resolution today. But part of starting your New Year's resolution today is also giving your body the resources it needs to function at a high level as we transition into the new year. And the only way to do that is by practicing something, you know, as far as like that dietary strategy, like I said, using fasting as a, as a tool or at least at the very least practicing discipline and not putting yourself in a deficit going into the new year because that's exactly what we do you'd be surprised at how many people in the in the year in a deficit and and their new year's resolution um really just ends up being trying to climb their way out of that hole that they created and and the 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 health deficit we create is mostly between October and January. That's when we really create our largest health deficit for the year. So if we could put intention on not creating that health deficit through poor actions at the end of the year, then focus our mental and our mentality on what we want to achieve as we go into the next year, and then support all of that with fasting and dietary strategy, then we could see some amazing results the first quarter of the year. And I think that that will give you guys the motivation to be successful leading into the second quarter. That's summer body season. You know what I mean? So I think it's important just to understand how all of this works. Now, typically, I like to promote that you guys are doing a three-day preparation before you, or I'm sorry, a seven-day preparation before you start doing any fasting. I'm going to briefly break down the preparation in case you guys have never heard it before. But the, the, the way we're going to start preparation for a fast, whether it's a three-day fast, intermittent fasting schedule that you're going to do on a regular basis, or even a 21-day fast, you want to start by increasing your hydration levels. It's important that you have proper hydration because most of us are dehydrated. I When, when we look and we observe people in the modern world, we see that um, 80% or more of people are dehydrated, okay? And 
in that 80 percent, the majority of people are severely dehydrated so it's not like oh you know you just need a cup of water most people are severely dehydrated the severity of the dehydration is going to impact the level of this ease you experience in your body i've told stories many times of friends who had issues various issues and my suggestion was just simply to increase your hydration levels decrease the dehydrating foods you consume and their issues began to go away. So just by focusing on hydration levels, especially as we prepare for a fast, you will see a boost in uh, your vitality and your health. This is important, especially at the beginning of your preparation, because you want to be at a high frequency. It's important, right? We, we talk about the physical thing a lot, but it's also important that vibrationally, you are at a high frequency because this is going to affect your mentality and how you go into it. In the last live stream, we talked about can versus will. Your willingness to do something. This is going to improve and have a, have a direct impact on your willingness to do something. So you've created this plan of action, but you have to have a high willingness to do it in order for you to be successful. And even though these things don't seem to be correlated, your hydration levels have a direct impact on that. Part of the reason why we have issues in, in our world, in our relationships with politics and foreign policy and all these things is because we have a society, we have several societies of people that have what I call toxic thinking. The toxic thinking comes from literally having mucus on the brain. So if you guys think about the body as an electrical circuit, which you know it pretty much is, in order for an electrical circuit to function optimally, there are certain elements that need to be in play. One of those elements is you have to have a conductor that that will allow the, the, the movement of the energy without a lot of resistance, okay? Your, the conductor that you use, the metal wire that you use, it, it plays a very important role. There's conductors, there's semiconductors. There are things that don't conduct electricity well. They conduct electricity, but they don't, they don't conduct it very well. When you have mucus on the brain, mucus does not conduct electricity well. So literally signals that are being sent from the brain to other parts of the body, whether it's glands, organs, um, you know, digestive system, whatever, wherever, or if it's your just your ability to process information, your higher cognitive function. All of it will be lowered because you have mucus on the brain. And this mucus can come from your dietary habits, but it also can come from the things that we put on our body. So this could be hair dye. This could be relaxers. This could be nail polish. This could be lipstick. This could be lotion. This could be colognes, deodorants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All of these things can potentially have an effect on the amount of mucus that's produced and introduced to the brain. This means that you're going to have a lower possibility to, to perform well at work, perform well in your uh, relationships. I mean, shoot, even performing, um, you know, when you're in your intimate settings, like it, it affects you holistically. So it's important to get that mucus off the brain. And, and one of the best ways to do that is through hydration. Hydration is going to help drain the sewage. Right. We've got the lymphatic system, which is your, your 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 sewage system, if you will. And if you're not if if that system is not moving well and if it doesn't have fluidity, then you're going to have backed up sewage and you're going to have mucus and you're going to have all kinds of issues. One very simple tip for you guys to know if you have backed up lymph system, which you you likely do if you haven't been actively um, working on it. It's, it's more than likely stagnant. But one glaring obvious thing is if you have swollen lymph nodes, okay? You guys can do a very simple Google search and figure out where the lymph nodes are. And you, you'll be able to see whether or not you've had these swollen lymph nodes. It's, it feels like a pimple, but like a large, like a really large pimple. Um, I mean, it depends. It doesn't have to feel really large, but it's like a sore. But it has like a, it's like a pimple kind of vibe or a lump, you know, and it's sore. And um, you might notice that it gets swollen. Uh, you might notice it gets swollen and it goes away. 
and you might notice that it gets swollen or agitated after you eat certain things or some of y'all might just just have them there and you're just dealing with them and you don't know what they are maybe you're scared and you don't you don't even you know there's this we have this fear of the unknown they've made us so fierce fearful of tumors and cancer and things of that nature that some of us will just stick our head in the sand and we'll just say forget it and all this time it could have been something you know, not even that big of a deal that you could have easily, you know, resolved. I will tell you guys that one cool way to reduce um, the that stagnant lymph buildup, like if you if you have those swollen lymph nodes, is castor oil. Castor oil. We've been talking about castor oil recently, and um, you know, we we uh, as a brand we started selling the castor packs. But the reason we started to do that is because we wanted you guys to be familiar with the benefit of castor oil. Castor oil is in, incredibly beneficial. You can, if you've got, um, if you've got areas in your body where you've got these swollen lymph nodes, you can put you can put castor oil on it. You just, you know what I mean, as a treatment, maybe two two times a day. You you know, in the morning and then maybe like midday or evening, you just rub some castor oil on there. And allow that castor oil to penetrate and break up that stagnant lymph fluid. You know, um, you want to make sure your castor oil is hexane free, comes in a glass bottle, organic, all that stuff. OK, it's very, very important because castor oil is a deep penetrating oil. And if it has any um, chemicals in it that that really shouldn't be in there, any unnatural or synthetic chemicals, it's going to leach deep into your system. So it's very important you have a pure uh, castor oil and we've done a very good job of sourcing our castor oil it's honestly i'm not even gonna hold y'all it's the most incredible castor oil i have personally ever used okay that's just my personal opinion i'm sure some of you all live on different islands or you guys even manufacture castor oil as one of your main products i'm sure you guys have experienced really really nice castor oil but i've also experienced very subpar castor oil Okay, so this castor oil is different. If you guys get some and you feel it and touch it, you'll know. You'll know what I'm talking about. But um, that's a very simple technique for just breaking up the, that that sluggish lymph fluid. And um, this is going to boost your immunity. It's going to boost your health. It's going to help you think more clearly. It's going to help to remove that mucus from the brain. And now all of a sudden, you're seeing um, uh, just like a boost across your life. You're, you're seeing a boost across your life. Wouldn't it be amazing to just not have to worry about getting sick? Like, could you guys imagine a world, your world, where you don't even think about getting sick? You would be surprised because I, I have had the opportunity to live on both sides of the spectrum. And you would be surprised how freeing it is. You wouldn't think about it because you just think sickness is a part of life. You would be surprised at how freeing it is to just never be worried about sickness. There are people, I went to the park one time, um, I went to the park um, to just go for a walk, okay? And the person that was um, with me was so concerned about sunscreen, so concerned about the sun and the damage of the sun and getting skin cancer and all this stuff and worried about me, whether or not I was wearing it. And I'm just like, bro, I'm not worried about that at all side note do you guys understand that a lot of the sickness and ailment that is that is caused by the sun comes from what you put on the sun on the skin so you think with we think that it's just the sun the sun is just damaging the sun is just harmful well no the sun is not damaging or harmful but what happens is we will put jergens on our skin we will put Vaseline on our skin. We will put sunblock on our skin or all these other chemicals on our skin and our hair. And then the sun will start breaking that material down. It will unlock those chemical bonds and that those, those raw chemicals will start leaching into our skin and our bloodstream. And that's how we get sick. Think about it like this. It's no different from if you have a plastic bottle, okay? You have a plastic container you put water in the plastic container. You put that water out in the sun. The sun then starts breaking down the chemical constituents of that plastic, and it leaches into the plastic, into the water. 
That's the reason why they tell you don't drink water that's been sitting out in the sun. If it's been in a plastic bottle, it's because the sun breaks down those chemical bonds that those constituents leach into the water and you consume those raw chemicals. There's, it's no different on your skin. It's, it's worse, probably, because <laughs> it's going right into your bloodstream. So this is why I teach you guys, you know, you got to be careful about what you eat. Yes, but you have to be you have to be cognizant of your consumption overall. It's not just simply about what you put in your mouth. It's also about what you put on your skin, what you put in your hair, what you put on your lips, what you put on your eyes, what you put on your nails. Everything. All of these surfaces are porous. They're permeable. OK, they, 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 when you put something on your flesh, on your nails, on your hair, it will absorb. The level at which it absorbs can be debated. The impact that it has can be debated. But it need, you need to be under you need to understand that if it goes on your body, if you touch it, it will absorb. I saw a um a demonstration, okay? And you guys could probably find this on, on YouTube. It'd probably be easy to find. But I saw a demonstration. This guy has a chlorine tester, and he has two glasses of water. Okay, so he has two glasses of water. They're both just normal tap water. You pour the water from the tap. Boom, put the glasses on there. He has his chlorine tester. As he's testing one glass of water, his hand is sitting in the other glass of water. Okay, so he's testing one glass. His hand is just sitting in the other glass of water. And you can see the there's a it's a color change test so as he's testing the one glass of water you can see the chlorine cuz it turns yellow based on this this test that he does it's got it turns the water yellow okay and you can see all of the chlorine in the water and in the 10 to 15 seconds that he's doing the test on this glass of water he's got his hand in this glass of water he takes his hand off and he starts testing the glass of water that his hand was in you guys know what the results were? No chlorine in the water. In the 10 or 15 seconds it took him to test this glass of water here, his hand had absorbed all the chlorine out of the water. That's how well our body absorbs chemicals. We have to be very aware of this to the point where, and I'm a, you know, I don't want to go too deep, but like, the dye from the clothes we wear absorb into our skin. Your fabric softeners. What, what are the chemicals in your fabric softeners? So the chemicals in your fabric softeners are now in your clothes. You put your clothes directly on your skin, and those chemicals are constantly leaching into your skin. I'm going to take it a step further. I don't even use normal toilet paper anymore. I have changed my toilet paper from the traditional toilet paper that you guys would see at the grocery store, you know, the white bleach toilet paper. I've gone from that to a completely all natural toilet paper because the chemicals in your toilet paper would blow your mind. Now, the thing is, when we have been desensitized so much that even though these chemicals are burning us and going into our system constantly, we're unaware of it. We're unaware of it. But if you will notice, you know, for those of you who, I don't know, maybe you have babies or you've interacted with babies, babies are, are much more sensitive. You know, there's a lot of things that we do as adults that if you do it to a baby, it'll give them an irritation or a rash. That's why it's so common for them to be irritated. And we just think, oh, their skin's just sensitive. No, their skin is normal. <laughs> Our skin is desensitized. Our skin, we have been desensitized to all of the, the chemicals and everything that we come in contact with so that when the body, the body can't send those normal signals, those signals that are going to keep you, you know, this it's the, goes back to this whole story of, um, you know, when you touch a hot stove, you got to touch it to know it's hot, right? It goes back to that whole thing. 
The whole reason why when you touch the hot stove, you ooh, flinch your hand off real quick is because of your nervous system. Your nervous system is going to tell you, uh, oh, by the way, this is hot. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'm not going to touch that anymore. Right. It's the nerves. It's the nerves. Uh, the nerve endings are going to give you a um, feedback. They're going to give you feedback to let you know hot. OK, boom. I don't need to touch that. What happens if those nerves don't exist or they've been dulled to the point where you can't feel that that stove is hot? You will melt your hand. You'll literally melt your hand. So if we understand that simple concept that in this case, pain is good, right? Pain is good. It's it's alerting of alerting us of something. It's giving us information or data. And it also it also conveys the intensity so the intensity of the pain is going to give you an idea of how quickly you need to move and how extreme your reaction needs to be. But but this these nerves are everywhere and your body responds to this type of stuff all the time. It's just as we get older, the signal becomes more dulled because the system has been uh, degraded. It's not it doesn't work like it's supposed to. But this is why we see like little infant babies react so violently to the things we do every day with no problem. It's because they're they are they have a they have a normal functioning uh, system that gives them feedback. And then you get these rashes and you get this uncomfortability and then, you know, OK, I need to do something different with the baby. But I noticed that when I started doing my fast. Especially my long term fasting. I would become I would the sensitivity would come back, you know. So what I realized during that time is that toilet paper would irritate me. <laughs> it would irritate me. Toilet paper, the shower water, uh, different different chemicals that I would ingest, like mouthwash or toothpaste or even deodorant. As I started to fast clean my system, I started getting this feedback from my system. So it taught me a lot of things. You guys have the same ability. It's just that depending on where you are in your wellness journey, you may or may not notice it. There are people that have a sensitivity to like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and just electromagnetism or, or um, alternating current. There are there's a there's a subset of people that have a quote unquote high sensitivity to these things. And, you know, it's hard. I don't know. It, do they have a high sensitivity or do they have a normal sensitivity? Because if I'm being honest, none of our electrical devices, Wi-Fi, none of that stuff is good for us. So so if someone can sense it and they have a violent reaction, are they sensitive? Like, are they highly sensitive or are they just normal sensitive? Have we just been dulled to it? One interesting thing that you guys can think about, and um, you guys could do your own research, okay? This is just, I'm just throwing this information out there. You guys could do your own research. Ask yourself, is there a correlation between when we change or upgrade our telecommunication systems and pandemics? When we change, when we upgrade from 3G to 4G, was there a, a, a at least a nation, a nationally, uh, I think it was a worldwide thing, honestly, but was there a disease or a virus or something that started going around around that time? You just ask yourself that question. Look at Look at when we upgraded from 3G to 4G, and look to see if there was any national or international element going around at that time. Or from 1G to 2G. Or from 4G to 5G. Did you notice any diseases or any ailments that everybody, everybody seemed to be getting sick? Y'all notice anything? Around that time, a couple of years ago, maybe when 5G released, you notice anything? You notice these swine flus? You ever notice that? Bird flus? Do is it possible? 
do those correlate with us changing our um, telecommunications and the frequencies that are being put in the air? I don't know. I'm just asking. Have you guys noticed it? Do you see anything? But anyway, the point is Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, these things are not healthy. Okay. They could be. They could be. But I think they want them not to be healthy. We carry we carry this stuff around. We carry devices that emit this frequency on our person. I know you guys have seen um, these tests that have been done where the people will wear these sensors on their their head, on their brain. And they'll they'll, you know, do like, a oh, this is what happens after a 30 second phone conversation. You know, and they put the they put their phone to their head and those signals are being sent back and forth and the damage that's being done to the brain is insane insane um i'm sure if you guys look close enough there's warning on the packaging on your cell phones and things of that nature uh but that's neither here nor there i'm getting a little off topic the point is that these these people that are sensitive um it's not that something is wrong with them there's something wrong with our technology. There's something wrong with our way of life. There's something wrong with our water and our food and our toilet paper and your underwear. Women, have you ever have you ever thought that if you if you get regular infections, have you ever even considered it could be from your underwear? Or some of you might not maybe you wear leggings and you don't wear them with underwear. Apparently, that's a thing. You know, have you ever thought that it could be the clothing, the chemicals in the clothing? Did you know that? Um, I don't know if it was Timu, Timu or Shin, Sheen, that they tested. They specifically tested the crotch area of the leggings for for one of these companies. Maybe both of them. It's probably all of them. To be honest with you. Um, and they found cancer causing chemicals specifically in the crotch area. They the chemicals that were found in the crotch area weren't even found in the rest of the garment, but they were specifically found there. Do you think that's an accident? You think that's a mistake? You think someone missed that? Or do you think that the, they do it because it just makes the product cheaper and more affordable? It, it's it's none of the above. This is done on purpose. Now, I'm not saying that the manufacturers are necessarily, they're like, oh, we're going to make people sick. It goes way big. It's way over their head. It's way bigger than them. There are systems in place that create an environment for us that is constantly reinforcing sickness, and it's way bigger than anybody ever really could think about. And there's always a justification for why it is the way it is. There's always some logical explanation for why things are the way they are. There's always an explanation for why there's fluoride in the water. If you guys start researching the harmful effects of fluoride, and if you research where fluoride originally came from, there's a naturally occurring fluoride. And then there is a byproduct that is a fluoride that comes from the aluminum companies, if I'm not mistaken. The natural forming fluoride is not what's in our water. It's not what's in your toothpaste, okay? There is a byproduct that's in the water, and there's a byproduct in the toothpaste, and there's a byproduct that's in all these other things, and it's a very toxic byproduct. You guys should do some research on it if you're not familiar. But then once you do the research and you realize, wait, this stuff should not be in our drinking water, then it begs the question, wait, well, why is it in our drinking water? This cannot be by mistake. It only takes you one day of research to figure out this shouldn't be in our water. So how is it that those government bodies and those agencies that are there to protect us, how is it they haven't caught this? Wait, how is it that they even allowed it to be in there in the first place? It's not like the the the, the companies are just dumping it in there without our knowledge. They have permission to do so. How did that happen? You guys got to start asking questions. So. That's all I've got. Um, as we start going into this cold and flu season and we're going to decide, okay, we're going to eat the turkey. We're going to do this, that, and the other. If you guys want to do it, that's fine. Okay? 
but keep it to a minimum. And also, I would highly recommend um, some fasting. Okay, you guys can practice regular intermittent fasting. You can practice, you can step it up a notch and go to one meal a day. If you guys are going to have your Thanksgiving meal, just fast. Do a one meal a day on that day. And then um, keep your portion moderate. Don't, don't, you know, overindulge. And then save one, save a plate for tomorrow. And you can have one meal tomorrow. And that way you can diffuse the concentration of toxicity in your system during that time. You know, trust me, I used to be that guy. I'd be like, look, I I really just want to pig out. This is one time of the year I get to pig out. But let's be honest, we're picking out all the time. Even if you don't realize it, you are. If you're not intentional about what you eat, you you probably are to a degree picking out. Because we're eating, you know, you eat a Snickers bar, you don't think, well, that's not picking out, Chris. Do you have any idea how calorically dense a Snickers bar is? Like, we we there's a lot of things that we don't consider pigging out, but it really is. So we pig out all year long. We really do. Uh, processed foods and stuff are very calorically dense. So it's not just, oh, let's just pig out one time a year. No, you've been pigging out all year long. It's just, it's it's to the umpteenth degree during Thanksgiving and Christmas. All right, I'm going to grab a couple of y'all's questions out of the chat before we rock out. Hit the like button for me, y'all. If you're watching and you have not subscribed, subscribe. Why haven't y'all subscribed yet? Uh, oh, I'm going to just put this up real quick. Castor oil is great for the brain to help prevent dementia and Alzheimer's. I oil my scalp once a week. So... Obviously, when we when we talk about castor oil, we usually think about like growing the hair, like it's good for growing the hair. But just think about it. Like, why is it good for growing the hair? If we think about why it's good for growing the hair, we might come to the conclusion that it's good in general. And uh, apparently it's good for preventing dementia. That's big. There's a lot of people that as we're getting into our golden years, we are starting to see a lot of dementia. And um, there are medications that some of you all might have been on in your 40s and 50s that you don't know are linked to dementia because, look, a lot of this stuff is new, right? A lot of these diseases and things that we're dealing with, this is new. This generation, we, we, we're just now really starting to see it at the scale that we see it. So we're, we're just now seeing the impact of what we were doing 40 years ago. And it's not too late. It's not too late. We could get ahead of this and we could start making improvements in our health and wellness. We just got to understand. We got to know the importance of making these changes. We have to be consistent. And um, you can you can eliminate that fear of, of literally losing your mind as you get older, losing your memories, not knowing who your 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 siblings are, your children are, or your spouse is. That's that's extremely sad. I, I honestly, I think that's a fate worse than death. That's just my personal opinion. To be a walking shell of yourself. I've seen that in my family many times. And it's, it's, it's very sad. You do not want that for yourself. Okay. What can cut through all this mucus? So first of all, you want to cut out dairy products. Uh, refined sugars, dairy products are probably one of the biggest mucus forming foods. It's, I mean, it's probably one of the, if not the number one mucus forming food. So people always ask why I have, I have four foods that I tell you guys to just cut out. You're either going to cut them out completely or greatly reduce your consumption of these four foods, meats, dairy products, processed foods, refined sugars. So I always get pushed back on the meat and the dairy products. Understand, number one, the meat and the dairy products that we consume today, generally speaking, okay, this isn't for everybody everywhere, 
But in our modern world, the meats and dairy products we get are not the same product that our grandparents or our great grandparents would have consumed. So even though they ate it and they lived to be 100, we have a completely different product. The chemical constituents of these food products are different. The way it's processed is different. <clears throat> the way the animals are maintained are is different. And the energetic composition of the food is different. It's not the same product, okay? So you have to be extremely careful about what you consume as it relates to milk and dairy. Back in the day, did we drink milk? Yes, but it was raw milk. The stuff we drink now is not even comparable to what our what the milkman used to deliver back in the day. Everything was in glass as well. So you have to look at the packaging. You have to look at the manufacturing process. Okay. So there's a reason why I tell you guys to reduce or eliminate these foods. Now, if you're going to eat these foods, increase the quality. Pay the extra coin to get a high quality product. Right. When I buy my oils. I buy high quality product. I'm the dude that's spending the $30, $40 on the little normal size of an olive oil or whatever because it doesn't have any extra crap in it. You know, like that means something. That's important. We used to be able to get that product locally at our farmer's market, but not anymore. Manufacturing has changed all that. So um, cutting out those, those, those items will help increase in the quality of the food products you do consume. Uh, utilizing, if you guys want to grab a caster pack, I've got the caster packs on the on the uh, the website, healthyalternative.org, and you guys can get the caster pack and the caster oil that we recommend, so you know you're getting a high quality product. I'll say I'll put the link in the chat for you guys. You just go to a healthyalternative.org and you just go to the shop, and that will help with the mucus and stuff. I've been doing it, which is why I've been coughing up mucus and you know. Um, I've been doing a little challenge for myself recently, and so I've been detoxing. But that's good. When you start coughing up mucus, you know it's coming out. And this is actually something I noticed when I very first started fasting. I would cough up mucus. So, you know, a lot of times we'll think, oh, we're getting sick, da 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 No, you're not necessarily getting sick. You need to understand what you're doing and why. And then you'll see, oh, okay, the reason I'm coughing up mucus and stuff is because I'm detoxing. So hydration is key. Obviously, we talked about that earlier. You hydrate well. You know, wear your caster pack. I recommend just start, wear it on your liver. So you can just put it, it's right underneath your rib on your right-hand side. Uh, you just put a tablespoon on the caster pack and you tie it around. You sleep with it. You could wear your caster pack anywhere. It's big, though, so it's probably going to be in the abdomen. Um, but they do have smaller caster packs you can wear on your thyroid or over your eyes and things of that nature. And you can also use herbs. You know, there's, there's some pretty amazing herbal blends out there. Some of you all might know that we have been working to, to get you guys a, a, a suite of herbs available. Um, a mucus blend is actually on our list. We've been testing and stuff. We just haven't brought it to market yet, but there's different herbs you could use to help bust up mucus as well. But busting it up and eliminating is one thing. You also have to keep it from being produced by changing habits. I want to do a watermelon fast. Is it okay to eat seedless watermelon? Yeah, so look. Obviously, in America, we're not in watermelon season. Uh, people have pointed that out to me repeatedly. <laughs> um. Is it okay? Yes, it is okay, right? Because doing a watermelon fast is probably going to be better than any what you're doing currently. So it's going to be beneficial. Is it optimal? No, it's not optimal, all right? We wouldn't recommend that you go out and look for seedless watermelon to do, but we understand finding seeded watermelon is difficult, maybe even impossible at this time of the year, but you also can use a different fruit if you want, you know? I used to tell people losing weight, fasting, all this stuff is pretty easy. Like I can make you, I can make you a diet where you you can lose weight eating Oreos. It's all about it's all about understanding the frequency, the tools that you could use and stuff. So there's lots of different options you could do. You know, it's it's uh it's winter time now. You get you a gourd, 
get you some butternut squash, you could do a squash fast where you only eat squash. Okay. Now, obviously, butternut squash and stuff like that's going to be hard. So you'd have to cook it. But having roasted squash every night in the place of your watermelon, um, even though you cooked it, would still be insanely beneficial for your health. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys could really play around with it. You not only with that, with that particular method, not only are you getting a fruit, okay, you're cooking it. So, you know, you're losing some water content there. Okay, I get that. But it's seeded, it's in season, and you are essentially mono fasting. Mono fasting meaning you only eat one whole food item per meal. So one of the greatest benefits of the watermelon fasting is that it is a mono fast. That means that your body can digest it very seamlessly and the body is smart. So as you start to give it the same thing over and over again, it basically starts to digest it optimally because it's used to it. So I know we don't think about it like this because we typically would not promote eating cooked food on a fast, right? But if you're mono fasting, you could you could cook your butternut squash and have butternut squash, or you could use or you could use cucumbers, and then you don't have to cook it. You could just use cucumbers or zucchini. Any of those will work. You just mono fast on them. That's all you're going to eat. But yes, you could use seedless water watermelon to answer your question. How to fast while working that requires a lot of energy. My recommendation, if you're going to be working or exerting yourself, you're either going to be doing a uh, a juice fast. OK, so you could do a juice fast. And that means you're going to be I would I would recommend. Actually, I would recommend juice feasting, which is drinking a gallon, basically a gallon of juice a day. And then you could do whatever you want because you you're getting your caloric intake. So that would be like very, that's a very easy way. Just drink juice, drink a ton of juice all day and just live life like it's normal. You, if you're going to do water, if you want to do water fasting, I'm going to recommend a one meal a day strategy. So you're, you're still going to eat every day, but you're only going to eat once a day. And when you eat, if you want to get the most out of it, you eat a raw meal. I know this isn't long-term water fasting, but you're asking a very specific question. You, you a lot of energy, maybe concentration focus. Um, you do one meal a day and you eat a raw meal for that meal. Okay, so that's another way. You could also do fruit fasting. Fruit fasting is where you just eat fruit and that's all you eat. And once again, I understand you are consuming food, but even though this isn't a traditional water fast, it's going to give you amazing results. You're looking to lose weight. You're looking to boost your immune system. You're looking to invigorate yourself. You're going to get tremendous benefit from using any one of these techniques. Okay, last question. Can castor oil dissolve uh, cataract cyst fibroids? Yes, it can. I feel like Obama. Yes, you can. Yes, we will. What was his slogan? Yes, we can or something like that. Yes. Simple answer is yes. Um, you do not put castor oil directly in your eye. Understand that. Do not put castor oil directly in your eyes. Okay. You could put it around the eye socket. You can also get a, um, a castor pack that goes over the eyes and it'll slowly diff diffuse through your eyelids as you sleep. You do not put it directly in your eyes. As far as like cysts and fibroids, if you know where they're located, you want to put the castor pack above wherever it's located because the castor oil will penetrate down into. So you put it wherever you wherever it's located um, for the for the ovaries and stuff. If, you know, you just put it where the ovaries are located in the body and you wrap it around and you let it um, diffuse into the skin. All right, y'all, I've got to run. We have a Pam call coming up here. Um, I'm actually a minute late. So if y'all are in the Pam family. I'm about to go live on the Pam call. So uh, for those who don't know, that's our premium accountability membership. You can join it if you want to join the premium accountability membership. 
um, you're going to want to go to, let me see if I could grab the AHA Fasting Academy. I'm going to grab the link for y'all real quick. But it's the ahawellnessacademy.com. ahawellnessacademy.com. And then you go to the store and you guys should see the premium accountability membership in there. If we updated it. I don't know. I got to double check. Anyway, y'all, this has been fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, stay safe out there, man. The holiday season to get you. Like, comment, subscribe. Peace.